I want to talk to you a little bit about evolution. Um, uh, evolution is being taught all over the world. Actually, uh, what most people don't realize is that um, uh, some years ago, probably sort of 15 years ago, through the knowledge of DNA, uh, scientists found out some uh, alarming uh, information. And they found out through the knowledge of DNA that in fact nothing evolved. Um, it's called intelligent design. And these scientists are increasingly become greater in number as the years go on. And of course, uh, any scientists are looking at the DNA in such um, with such greater understanding now that they're seeing the evidence of a designer, a, a creator of, uh, in other words, like a cat was always a cat, a dog was always a dog, a monkey was always a monkey, and a human being was always a human being. Uh, also through DNA is that, uh, you know, you can trace your ancestry back and um, that uh, actually they've traced the ancestry back of the entirely, the scientists have gone, they've traced the human ancestry back right the way back. Uh, that's that they've, they've gone to all different parts of the world, all different colors of the, the different um, skin colors, and they've traced that they've all got a common uh, ancestor. They can trace everyone back to one woman. And in fact, they've, they've called her Eve because in Hebrew, he, uh, Eve means mother of all living. Um, now, of course, uh, you know, we, where you think to yourself, well, why aren't we being taught all this in schools? Why aren't the schools teaching our children evil, uh, intelligent design? I mean, surely if it's the most up-to-date scientific evidence, um, then of course, why? Well, the, I mean, surely the schools will be teaching the most up-to-date scientific evidence. But what you find is that you find that actually the government um, uh, are, uh, are intent on making sure that people believe evolution. They've been intent on on, on uh, making sure people believe in evolution. They they uh, the first thing they do obviously is is they teach the children in school, and um, and as we grow up, we don't doubt it. We think well, evolution must be a fact. We read the Bible and we find out that um, that God created Adam and Eve, and we find out that um, that uh, that uh, that you know we, it doesn't sit. Uh, death did not come until after the sin of man, and um, and of course so that flies right in the face of the whole theory of evolution. So uh, many people they think to themselves, well, evolution obviously is the facts, and the Bible's just all made up. When of course uh, it's not. It's not made up at all. Is that there are spiritual powers and forces of evil and wicked, uh, from wicked places that are doing their best to um, to prevent people from the obvious, really, and that's to believe in a creator God. Well, as I say, modern science now is coming to that comes to that final conclusion that, in fact, everything is intelligent design. But I just want to talk to you a little bit about evolution, and uh, and I want you to sort of consider some of the things I'm saying. And if you look back into the history, and you perhaps Google a few of the things I'm interested, I'm talking about right now. Um, I mean, the film about DNA is called Unlocking the Mystery of Life. You get the DVD or the documentary or, you know, you can, I think you can find it on YouTube. Um, but it's well worth buying. It's well worth getting into your schools, into your headmaster. You know, I'll be honest, I don't think it's uh, I don't think they're going to take too much notice of it uh, because the government will sack anyone that teaches intelligent design. They are not allowed to teach intelligent design in schools. They have to teach evolution. Now, let me just talk about evolution for a moment. Uh, evolution, uh, if you go back, say, four or five hundred years, if for those that are uh, real academics, you'll be able to get the exact name of the person, you'll be able to get the um, all the details, uh, you'll be able to get the exact exact year. Um, but approximately four to five hundred years ago, there was uh, a scientist that, um, that had the theory of evolution. Now, he was very unpopular, of course, because people believed in the biblical account of creation. Um, he was very unpopular, but nevertheless, he had this theory. And his theory began believing that there was originally one huge planet. And from that one very, very huge planet that was absolutely massive, spontaneously exploded. There was no God, no creator, just what just spontaneously exploded. Didn't know why it exploded, just spontaneously exploded. And of course, from that explosion come all the planets and eventually us on planet Earth. And of course, uh, you know, over millions of, or even billions of years, eventually here I am talking to you. And here's the, you know, there's you are listening to me. That's the theory of evolution. Um, now, the thing is, is that that, that, that chap, the theory um, was caught on by the scientists, but scientists would come along and go, no, 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 that uh, that planet was much smaller than that. It wasn't as big as that. So they'd make out their same theory, um, but they're just the planet would be much smaller. Well, I believe that by the time I was born, I'm, I'm nearly 60 years old, by the time I was, I was born, um, 1958 I was born, um, I believe that that by that time, that planet, other scientists had come along and that planet had got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually 
they were saying that every single thing in the every every incidentally they've found billions more stars over, uh, through through the through the Hubble telescope and other telescopes as well billions more stars more galaxies you know let's be honest it goes on for eternity it's, it's, it's infinity out there they have got no idea what's out there for all, all they know all what they know of is just you know you could fit into that little area just there and and everything is everything's so much bigger than what they actually think but the billions and billions of stars the earth the moon everything that every every bit with everything with car and matter within it they said was no bigger when it was squashed down to a pencil a pencil dot at the end of your sentence that's how small that planet got now incredibly there were some really intelligent people that believed that and of course they continue then to write their books and write their theses and and uh, and to speak in the in the universities and in the in the great colleges and of course the teaching comes down right the way through to the school children in our schools they get taught they come from monkeys they get taught that they evolved and um but what you got to ask a question this is interesting children if anyone's listening to this and they and they would like to just um you know have a, an interesting conversation with a teacher or, a, or a, a scientist or a philosopher somebody that um that believes in evolution you say to them well where did, where did we come from then and they're going to say well we come from monkeys you say well, where did the monkeys come from you say well they're going to come from a smaller mammal you say well where did the smaller mammal come from well an even smaller mammal well where did that come from and then they're going to say well it come from originally it originally come out the sea so it was originally a sea creature you, we were originally sea creatures that, that one of the one of the little sea creatures they grew legs and and uh, and come out and they, they their lungs adapted to the to breathe air and they become mammals and you say well where did that little sea creature come from and they say well a smaller sea creature and then you say where did that sea creature come from and eventually they go back to this single cell that spontaneously come to life no reason for it just just come to life and uh, and of course that eventually become you and i sitting here listening and talking about this then you say to them but where did that single cell come from and they'll say well the rain built up beat, beat down onto the rocks for millions and millions or some say billions of years and out of the, out the rocks and the sediment of course in the rocks come chemicals and that's where your chemicals come from for the single cell that spontaneously come to life so you say well, where did the rocks come from where did the rocks and where did the rain come from and they say ah oh, well there was a big bang you see and then they talk about the big bang and then they eventually come down to this dot and you're expected to believe that i mean i say i, I understand stupid up mister if you had to crush every little piece of every piece of steel down from my gym just my gym and crush it down to no more than a dot on the end of your page you would need real faith to believe that 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 was even possible now you got not got just to have the steel in the gym you've got to have all the steel in the entire world all the cars all every, every bit of metal you can think of think of it for a minute and imagine it squashed down to nothing more than a dot you believe that that's what they want you to believe this is that this is what evolution used to teach and now now they teach something even more but many evolutionists now teach that actually nothing existed it all come out of nothing this is what they teach there was nothing and it all came out of nothing nothing spontaneously exploded <laughs> and and out of this nothing spontaneous. But anyway let's just go back to the dot because i find the dot very interesting so you can imagine now because remember of course that this dot business was taught to our to our um our well to our parents to to to, to, to their grandfather to, to so now we got back to this dot they want us to believe that all the steel all the cars it all bopped down this little tiny little dot no, 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 no. you got to have the whole earth, everything, and the, the whole earth, I mean, the earth is a big place, if you've, if you've ever been out on an aeroplane, I've flown to very different parts of the world, it's a big place, right, you got to squash the whole earth down to nothing more than that dot, no, 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 not just that though, you got to take the moon in with it, the moon, you know, we look up the moon, there it is, you got to squash that down as well, now you got to take the sun, you got to squash the sun, which is magnificently huge. All right, if you're if you're technical and you know the technical dimensions and this and ever, you'll be sitting there going, "Wow, yeah, this guy doesn't really know how big things are, but yet he is is on the button." Do you know what I mean? You got to squash the sun down, and you got to squash the moon down, squash the earth down, and get it in that dot at the end of your page, that pencil dot. Now you're not just that, not just that. You've got to have the billions of stars. And the galaxies and 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 the, and the stuff that they know about right now squashed down no more than just that dot 
That's what they taught. That's what they taught evolution. Now listen to me. You gotta have such faith in that. You know, to me, it's pretty obvious. It's pretty obvious. I've just I've just got a Bible with me, Holy Bible. Incidentally, I'm a born again Christian. Jesus saved me, what, 25 years ago, April 1990. I was injured in the gym. I couldn't move my right left arm without pain. And I got desperate. I got desperate enough to cry out to Jesus. And I asked him, begged him to forgive all my sin. I gave my life to Jesus Christ. God came into my life and he saved me. And I said, Lord, heal my shoulder so I can do the things you know I want to do. And he healed me. I woke up in the morning completely healed. You know, uh, the Jesus came into my life and saved me. Now, I just want to say, this book, it, I, do I have to prove to you that this book was made by somebody? For me to prove the obvious, this book was made by somebody, do I need to go and get the person that put it together and, you know, printed it, the factory, the factory owner? Do I need to get him? Do I need to go and get the factory owner to prove to you that this book was made by somebody? No, of course not. You use common sense. You look at the book. There's the evidence. The book exists. There it is. Clearly, it was designed by somebody. Do you know how much more complex you and I are than that book? It's the, I mean, the book is the word of the living God. Most valuable thing on the face of the planet. You know, tells you about Christ and salvation and how to, how to get to heaven and how to, how to escape the f eternal fires of hell. Jesus come to save us. The devil wants everyone to believe in evolution because if you believe in evolution you'll throw this book away but now think about what i've said a little child he's saying to his teacher where'd this come from where'd that come from where'd this come from the teacher goes right the way back to the big bang and he says to her after she's explained about eventually everything being squashed down into nothing more than just a little dot so he says to her teacher when did you first hear that she says, when I was a child, <laughs> you see, listen, the boy says to the teacher, he says, listen, children will believe in anything. Thanks for listening. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would give me words to speak. Lord God, I pray, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, you would have me say and speak anything you want me to say right now. I pray, Lord God, in Jesus name. Amen. Welcome to Stan's gym. I'm Stan. I've been here 35 years. I've only been a Christian 25 years. When I was 18 years old, I, there was a tragic motorcycle accident in Upminster. I say tragic because there was a little group of us or a little gang of us motorcyclists and we all, all were just getting big bikes and racing and tearing around and having fun, just like lads do. But uh, unfortunately, um, we were in Upminster and we were I was pulling away from the, the fish and chip shop or the, the Chinese rather. My pals were pulling away from the fish and chip shop a bit further up the road. And as I pulled away and I went to turn right down the approach, my pals were overtaking me doing 90 miles per hour on their motorcycle. And uh, my best pal was on the back, a guy called Andrew Goff. And, uh, and a good friend of mine was, was riding a bike, a guy called Richard Burton. But they hit me in the side broadside. And as they hit me in the, in the side broadside at 90 miles per hour, as I turned right down the approach, what I experienced was two realities. If you'd have been there and seen this tragedy, other motorcyclists were there my pals a lot of people actually saw this take place if you'd have seen it take place you'd have seen my body and my pals bodies all go flying down the road i was it like a snooker like a snooker ball it right down the road and we laid down the road as dead men but what i experienced was at the point of impact drawn directly down as if drawn by gravity to the road below me my feet touched the ground and I fell into a position with one leg back, one leg bent under me and my hands stretched forward, my fingertips touching the ground. From that position I got straight up and I walked three or four paces and I sat down by the side of the road on like the pavement area, leaning up against a tree or sitting by a tree and I watched the bike burn. And I was no, I was totally unaware that in fact that I would, I'd physically died. I was totally unaware of it. As I sit there in this place, experiencing this amazingly heavenly feeling and being unaware that in fact I died, I saw a dark cloud come down above me, a cloud that filled the sky. And it caused me to look up because it drew my attention. And as I looked up, I heard Almighty God speak to me out the dark cloud. And God's voice was masculine and spoke to me, but gently and poignantly just to me. 
but I, because his voice filled the sky, I immediately knew it was Almighty God. And from what he said to me, immediately I realised my predicament. And I started to, I screamed because I wanted to live. And as I started to scream, God put me back inside my physical body in the twinkling of an eye and I was back looking at the ambulance lights going round. And I was all busted up. I was taken to hospital, all busted up. But nevertheless, thankfully, I recovered. Now you'd have thought to yourself that after an experience like this, with God speaking to me, experiencing the afterlife, realizing that I had a spirit and even though my physical body at that time was dead, I was still very much alive, very much able to experience love, to experience kindness, to experience, to hear, very able to walk, very, but also could experience fear. You'd think to yourself that I would have picked the Bible up and I'd have started reading the Bible and, and perhaps even become, you know, become a Christian at that point in my life. But no, I, I recovered, got out of hospital, and I just carried on with my life. And even though I always knew that God was real, double real, I believed in God beforehand, before the accident. But now I had this experience, I knew that God was double real. But I just carried on living my life. And I, that's part of the reason why I went with, through the injuries. I started getting involved in weights so that I would uh, strengthen my body so that I would, um, you know, get strong, get powerful. And once I began to realize in those early days about what could be achieved through training and how strong you could get, you know, a, a man can get two, three times as strong than what he was when he first starts out and how he can put pack muscle onto his body and change the way he looks. That's why I become a competitive bodybuilder and I also become a competitive powerlifter in a, in a smaller way, but here at the club. But the reason why I got involved in the training was because of this injury and I wanted to strengthen myself. But I got all wrapped up in my own life and just living my own way. And even though I believed in God, I know when I had opportunity to to uh, to, to perhaps pray to God and, and to, to perhaps ask him to forgive all my sins and to give up my life to the Lord for me to get right with God through faith in Christ, I'd always reject it. I was never ready. I always imagined, well, on my deathbed, when I'm about to croak, you know, oh, Jesus, please forgive all my sin. Give my life to the Lord then. So I, nobody wants to go to hell. And I, and I knew that hell was real. I knew hell was real deep down, even though I used to say, oh, there's no hell. But that's because it made me feel better. I, I felt better saying, oh, I don't believe in hell. But deep, deep down, I knew that there was a hell. I knew that there was a heaven. And I knew that Jesus was the only way there. God had revealed those things to me. And I can thank God for that. So I ended up getting injured in the gym because a competitive bodybuilder. I was always interested in powerlifting. I was always pushing my body to the extreme. But one of my main things that I did wrong in all those training years is I overtrained. I trained the body part too many times per week. I learned over the years now is that the, 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 even though we've got a world champion, Mike Joseph, come out of Stan's gym. He's an undefeated world record holder for flat bench press. Bench pressing, I think he weighed 82 kilogram and he bench pressed 200 kilogram training here at Stan's gym over a period of many years, training and slowly getting his weights up, but he's undefeated, world record holder. And he only used to train chest and body, each body part once a week. Well, back in the day when I was training, because I run my own club and it just seemed that loads of people train each body part twice a week. Some people even train each body part three times a week. Your body can't recover from it and therefore it causes injuries. And this is what happened to me through overtraining. It wasn't the fact that I was in the gym too many times, it was the fact I was training each body part too many times per week. That's where the problem lay. Anyway, so I ended up with an injured left shoulder joint and, uh, and, and a tendon or whatever it was, and I'm not sure what it was. The fact was, is the fact that it never got any better. And even though a couple of two or three years went by of me not being able to train, so I stopped competing, I stopped I stopped training. Because I, I, I just it just hurt me just to move my arm. So I got to a stage in desperation well, I was thinking about surgery. April 1990, I lay in bed thinking about surgery. And, uh, and, and I was, I, I was, I'll be honest with you, I've always been an optimist. I was always very optimistic in my life. But all of a sudden now, I, I, I'd really got to the end of the line and I thought, oh, I want to see a specialist. I want to get my shoulder operated on, get it fixed, borrow money if need be, 
get the shoulder fixed, and then I could get back training properly again, which is what I really, really missed in my life. I knew that that was a good thing in my life. I wanted to get back training. And as I lay in my bed, April 1990, Sunday morning, about two, three o'clock in the morning, I was living here at the gym at the time, at the back, just living at the back. And um, I was laying there and I thought to myself, God, it's going to take months to see a specialist. Well, God, he must know all about me because he created me. And with that, I sort of saw the light. You've heard that when people say, it? I see the light. Well, you only see the light when you come to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And that's why I saw the light. And I cried out to Jesus, Lord Jesus, forgive all my sin. I cried out to him. I give my life to you, I said to him. Forgive me. I give my life to you. And with my heart, I, I had a repentant heart. I didn't use the word repentance, but I just had a repentant heart. I wanted God in my life. I wanted to give my life to God. I'd had enough. And I then prayed, Lord Jesus, please heal my shoulder so I can do the things you know I want to do. I didn't know what that was at the time, but God see my heart. And God saw that what I wanted to do was the will of God. And that's exactly what's going on today. But I woke up in the morning. In that very morning, I woke up completely healed. You know, people have said to me, people have said, well, with all the different religions in the world, Stan, how do you know that you got the right one? How do you know that you really are in the right religion? Christianity, how do you know that? And I try and explain to them, listen, I died when I was 18 years old. God spoke to me out of the cloud. He gave me these revelations. I knew that Jesus died for my sin and rose again. I knew it. And when I come to the Lord in the way that God had laid out in the scriptures, he was there for me. And yes, he came into my life and filled me with his spirit and made me all brand new. Hallelujah. He healed me. He healed me physically. He healed me spiritually. And he made me one with himself. And that's, you know, so it's like, hello, you know, God's in my life. That's the reason why I know this is the right way for you to follow. Jesus himself said, speaking about himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. It means no one comes to heaven except through Jesus Christ. Why is that? Why is there only one way to heaven? Because God became flesh and come and lived a sinless life, born of a virgin, so there was no sin, sinful nature in Jesus because he didn't have a human father. He came from heaven. The virgin birth was, was miraculous. He lived a sinless life. And in living a sinless life, he performed many miracles. Once, once he was 30 years old and he, and he, and he, he, he was baptized in the Holy Spirit and he, he, he went forth for his, his ministry for around about three years, then it, that led to his death and his resurrection, his glorious resurrection. But during that time, there's many miracles, healings, uh, that, all types of miraculous things where people were being helped and God was showing his power through Christ. This is incredible. This is absolutely amazing because when you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, you start to live in a miraculous life. You start to see the miracles of God in your life from day to day. It's truly amazing how God answers prayer. I've had other miracles. I've had Jesus heal my knees. Now, the thing is, there's some miracles you get immediately, some miracles you get when God wants to give them to you. For some reason, I don't understand it. I don't understand God entirely. All our, God's ways and my ways, what I would do and what God does, sometimes will differ. Is because what I would do is one thing. What God does is something different. But nevertheless, I know that through my prayer relationship with God, God does miracles. There's nothing he can't do in your life. There's nothing he can't do in my life. If you trust him and you keep and you keep trusting him. First, you've got to come to him, begin to pray. There's a little child. You had to learn to walk. We've got me and my wife. We've got a baby and she's just learning to walk. Work walks a few steps and falls over. You know, you've got to learn to pray. Pray to Jesus, the one mediator between God the Father and us. The only mediator. There is no other. There is no other. There is no other religion that leads to God. There is only Christ. And Jesus is not a religion. Jesus is a person. He is God in flesh. So when people go, oh, Stan, you've got all religious on us. No, I haven't. I'm talking about a relationship that I've got with God that you can have too. Anyway, so Jesus, Jesus healed me. I woke up in the morning completely healed. Wow. And also, I'd become a Christian. So that was just like... Phew, Nobody expected that in my life. You know, no one expected me to stand out, become a Christian. To be honest, no one. Everyone was very shocked. But me, I'd got God in my life. And now God was beginning to show me, uh, not only his love, but to show me how he feels about other people, about the fact that God loves everybody. The God, oh, people go, well, does God love pedophiles? 
Does it mean to say that if a paedophile turns to Lord, he can get saved? The thing is, that, listen here. The Bible says that God hardens who he wants to harden and softens who he wants to soften. In the book of Romans, when it speaks about Pharaoh, I mean, you, you've heard the, the Ten Commandments. You've heard about when, when Pharaoh drowned, or rather, right, where the God drowned all the Egyptians in the, in the Red Sea. Do you remember about that? When, when the Israelites passed, passed went, on, went, on, went, went through the Red Sea on dry ground, when God parted the seas. You remember the story of the Exodus? Remember that story? When God put ten plagues upon Egypt? Remember that story? Well, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh had hardened his own heart so many times to the things of God and to the people of God, there came a point when God himself hardened Pharaoh's heart. So Pharaoh couldn't repent. That's what the Bible teaches you. God hardened him. God, the Bible says God hardens who he wants to harden, softens who he wants to soften. So at the end of the day is that, you know, when people say, oh, well, what about these, what about mass murderers? What about pedophiles? You know, surely God won't forgive them. Listen, if someone can come to God, then God will receive them, the Bible says. But let me tell you this. There's some people that have done such terrible things that God don't grant a repentance. There's some people that have done such awful things they can't come to God. It's not possible. It means they're going to burn. They're going to go in the lake of fire eventually. That's it. That God will harden their heart. The, that is a biblical teaching. And it's not something which is often said because when you go to churches, often people don't speak that way. But you read the Bible for yourself. You'll see it's there. It's there. So if you can come to God, you know you can come to god if if you can come to god jesus said anyone who comes to me will not turn away it means there's forgiveness of sin brand new life brand new being born again of the spirit in christ that's what god will offer you and, and, and with that a place in heaven sins washed away in a relationship with god the father through jesus christ if you can come to god and it's good to find out whether you can come to god or not that's the thing don't wait don't leave it don't because you know, never know what's going to happen in the rest of your life if you leave it, you might be to come now, but you think, no, I'm not coming now. I know it's all true, but I'm not ready. You want to, today is the day of salvation, God says. It's not about waiting until you're on your deathbed. Because by the time you get on your deathbed, your heart could have grown so hard, so, so calloused over towards the things of God. You could be such a, you could be such a different person than what you are right now. That it could be that you can't come to God. It's too late. It could be like that. It could be. So don't take the risk with your life. God loves you. He wants to see you saved. He wants to see you safe in his arms. He wants to come into your life. He wants to save you. That's what he wants to do. And he wants to help you and deliver you from sin. Now listen, you people say, oh, well, hold on a minute. I love my sin. Do you? The thing is, sin might seem nice at the time, but it ultimately is destructive. It might seem nice, but it's ultimately destructive. And what you'll find is that as God sets you free, I used to smoke marijuana at one time. When God set me free from that, and that was gone out of my life, do you know my life improved? My life actually got better. I enjoyed life more without it than what I did with it, even though at the time when I was stuck in, in that, in that uh, rut of smoking that stuff, you know, I would drive all over the place just to get a bit, just to get a little bit of puff, you know, because it was so important to me. But once Christ come into my life and me praying, repentant and asking God to deliver me and realizing it wasn't of the Lord, it wasn't God's will in my life. God set me, God, God in his time, he set me free and I was better off. So that goes for all sin. Anything which God says is sinful in your life, you'll find you'll be happier and better without it. I can promise you. I can absolutely promise you. Hand on heart, I can promise you. You'll have a better life. You want a good life? everybody wants a good life that's the reason why people do the things they do often it's because they just want fun they want a good life do you know a good life the best life you can have is a life in christ a life when you've got god in your life a life when you could because you know what blessed means blessed blessing blessing means blissfully happy that's what it means and god blesses those that come to him so that the happiness is inside Happiness, people in the world, they think happiness is about, you know, I mean, we all need money. We, 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 we all need lots of things in the world. But the point of it is, is that you can have all that stuff and still be unhappy. But if you come to God, you can have an happiness and a joy inside. You can have, even, even when everything else seems to be falling apart all around you, you can have an happiness and a peace and a joy inside of you because you've got God in your life. And you've got also is the fact as you pray, miracles can happen around you. Which means that you can fix some of the problems that you've got or the th problems you see in other people's lives just through the word of god 
and prayer. So Jesus saved me. Met all those years later, eventually I, I ended up with bad knees, which come about a different way because I was uh, basically I hadn't trained legs for a while, and I was doing leg press uh, with one of the strongest guys in the club, and um, and I ended up by allowing the wet leg press machine to come right down on me. Uh, it it put, didn't put me in a very strong position, and I injured my hip. And uh, I had a, I had a bad hip and bad, and I ended up with bad knees for about ten years. That's a long while to be praying, a long while to be asking God, a long while to be trusting God. But within that time, I carried on in the Lord. Within that time, I carried on praying. I was praying for people, witnessing, testifying, seeing people, seeing God heal other people, seeing God miraculously work in other people's lives while I limped along. But one day, the Lord took me around a, a, um, a couple of Christ, a Christians' houses, uh, Alan and Betty Tang from Ockenden born again Christian, lovely, lovely Christian family. As I walked through the door, got the Holy Spirit, the Lord prompted me to ask for prayer, which I did. I asked for prayer. Would you please pray for my knees? Because my, my knees was the thing that was playing up at the time. I was like an old man, couldn't walk about, couldn't kick a ball, got that bad. They said, they, they sat me down, he put his hands on my knees and he prayed. His wife was at the back with her hand on his shoulder, crying out to God. She's crying out to God in that heavenly language. And he's just saying, Lord Jesus, please heal Stan's knees. And he asked in a few different ways, just typically asking, just normal, like Jesus, please heal his knees. Jesus, heal his knees. You know, just asking God to heal my knees. Do you know, I got up out of there and I was completely healed, completely healed. I come back in the gym, healed. Within that first, within a few days, I've got under a squat rack, even though it was difficult because I'd lost some flexibility in my shoulders. I'm nearly 60 years old now. But the thing is, I, I got under the squat rack and within a, I could go up and down and squat, squat with the weights, knees never hurt. Within about a week or two weeks, I'd squatted 300 pounds in a full squat. It was difficult for me because I hadn't been training legs and I'd been, you know, for all those years. But nevertheless, I was still had some strength in me and I managed to squat 300 pounds for just, just for one rep. My knees never hurt. I've got new knees. I didn't need a knee replacement. It's okay if you have to have a knee replacement and that's what God does in your life and you have a knee replacement, fine. Thank God for modern science and for the technology within the medical healthcare and this stuff. Thank God for all those things. If you need to use those things, use them. When I, you know, if I need if I need antibiotics, I'll go to the doctors and get some antibiotics. I'll still pray, Lord, please heal me of whatever it is, but I'll go to the doctors if need be. But God gave me new knees. He gave me new knees. He fixed my shoulder and he's done so many miracles in my life. I could, I could, there's many things I could tell you, many, many things that I could tell you that are just incredible that only God could have done in my life. Now, I know when you see me wandering around the gym and saying, I don't get a chance to say all these things to you. Of course I don't. You know, you're, you come here to, to hear about the gym. You come here to, to train, to get big and strong and to like, you know, perhaps, you know, we've got powerlifters here. We, we have powerlifting competitions. Um, if we can, we have them every year. Uh, Matthew Lewis won the last powerlifting competition. He is the reigning champion. We have strongman competitions outside. We had one last year now. We only had one so far. We've had a strongman competition. Matthew Lewis won that as well. He's a local postman, but he's a, a very strong young, young man, incredibly strong. And he's been training, I think, about seven, six, seven, eight years. He's very, very strong. And um, I think he weighed 80 and a half kilogram and he deadlifted. 260 kilogram i think that's i think that's what he deadlifted and i think he bench pressed 145 kilogram and i think he squatted 195 kilogram very very powerful young man but he went up against the strongest guys in the club and there was some guys quite close to him but at the end of the day you know he's, he's the reigning champion so we have powerlifting champions strongman competitions i don't get a chance to talk about all these things about the lord to everyone in the club that's why i'm making this video just to encourage your faith in jesus christ to know that whatever problems you're having, even you're having problems in your marriage, God can fix them. If you're having problems, if, if whatever's going on, whatever's wrong in your life, start talking to Jesus about it and have faith. Serve God in your life. Find out about what God wants done in your life. I'll just say this before we go. Often I say, that Jesus says you must be born again of the Spirit to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's Matthew, Matthew uh, sorry, John 3 verse, verse 3. John 3 verse 3, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. A lot of people don't understand that. They think to themselves, why is that then? Just quickly, is that the law of God, the Ten Commandments, all the moral laws of God, when you look at them, you break them. That's called sin, and it condemns you before God. So everyone under the law of God is condemned already. It means if you die in the night, you're going to hell. Then you come before God on judgment day. God is vindicated because then you realize why you've gone to hell. 
and then you get cast in like eternal punishment lake of fire that seems really extreme but it was really only for the devil and the angels that's what god created hell for the devil and the lake of fire but because the devil tricked man in the garden of eden and because the, the mankind has bowed his knee to sin and the, the, the devil because of that mankind is, un, is is revealed in under the law of god we break god's laws what means we're sinners we're condemned no matter how many good things you try and do you still stand condemned you're under god's laws and you've broken them that's the reason why christ came to pay the death penalty for the sins of the world so he paid the death penalty for your sin and for mine when god became flesh so he hung on that cross when he said it is finished it meant the debt of mankind's sin is now fully paid for and he died and of course he rose again on that third day and commissioned his disciples to go out and preach the gospel of which that word come to me god saved me and that's what i'm doing so other people would know there's a way to heaven there's a way to be forgiven by god so when so when christ died for your sin rose again it's him that says you must be born again the reason why he says that is because if you receive a new life you're no longer under the law of god if you receive a new life in christ you become a new creature, a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. You get the new life in God. God now lives in you. There was a time when God didn't live in you. Now he does live in you. You've got this new life. You're no longer under the law of Moses that, con that condemns you in the sight of God. You're under grace in Christ. And you're saved by grace through faith in Jesus and the shed blood that he shed at Calvary for you and me. And because you're now under grace, God promises to never leave you nor forsake you. Now, if you leave the Lord, if you go off and start getting involved in organized crime and you and you start living just back in there, you forget God, deny God. Jesus said, if you deny the Lord, he'll deny you on the day of judgment. God is not a God who can be fooled. He can't be mocked. But you slip up into sin as you go on in your Christian life. You slip up. God forgives you. You ask the Lord to forgive you. are forgiven. You're saved by grace through faith. It's not by your works. God will just continue to work in your life so that you don't slip up so much. So you don't you don't do them things anymore that's the whole point of progressive sanctification god working his way out in your life working his way out to, throughout your life so that you have become more godly you enjoy your life more you enjoy life more you don't fall into the pitfalls of life all the temptations of life to go into go in the wrong direction jesus will lead you out because you're saved by grace through faith and you have a place in heaven so if you die in the night you go straight to be with the lord because you're forgiven you've you've been you've been set free set free from the eternal consequences of your sins now isn't that good news that's what you really want you know when you go to a funeral right everybody when you go to a funeral and my, my father passed away a couple of years ago we've all been to a lot of funerals and, it, and it, even funerals are always a tragedy because you're missing the person that's gone but the point is is when you go to a funeral you expect the man at the front there or the woman nowadays to say something nice to give the, the, the congregation hope of an afterlife to, to give them hope if you had someone stand up there and they went well you know they're dead now we'll never see them again and um you know there is no heaven and uh you know there, there's that when they're dead you're dead if someone stood up there in a few at the funeral and stood and said something like that to the congregation you can bet your life there'd be there'd be all sorts of trouble because people in the congregation that don't really think much about god at all don't even really think too much about eternity or anything they don't want to hear that they want to hear some hope so when we're in a in that situation where in in, in a funeral and you you know deep down in your you, the loved ones that you've passed away you would hope they've gone to a better place what the bible says is there's only one way to get to that better place and that's through jesus christ so our hope god is a god of hope that god reached them before they passed away which is quite possible because God loves people and he's by his spirit he reaches people even in the middle of the night he's ministering to them they're counting they're thinking about their eternity about where they're going to go the gospel message has reached them at some point in their life and they're now saying Jesus forgive all my sin I give my life to you and they've entered the kingdom and they've passed away and they've gone to be with the Lord but perhaps you always knew him as an atheist you always oh my dad was an atheist no he wasn't perhaps he wasn't perhaps he wasn't Perhaps towards the end of his life, God reached him and he's in the kingdom now. And the only way you're ever going to see him is if you accept Christ as your way, the way of salvation. You can't lose. With Jesus, you cannot lose. You cannot lose having God in your life. Anyway, it's been lovely to speak with you or, or for, for me to be able to speak with you. Um, obviously, clearly, if you want to speak to me about anything at all, please come and talk to me about it. But 
Uh, it, it, to be fair, whenever people come to the club and stuff like this, I normally just talk about weights and training and getting big and strong. And getting, I train with you. And most of the time, you know, 90 or percent, 99% of the time, I don't get a chance to talk about the Lord unless you ask me. If you ask me, I will tell you, you know, what God has, was revealed to me. Um, and can I just leave this with you is that, you know, please give God a chance in your life. You won't regret it.